This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. T-R-T-F-R. Truth Frequency Radio. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again for another week of eye-gouging, crotch-kicking, no-holds-barred political discussion right here on TFRLive.com, Truth Frequency Radio, along with the iHeartRadio app, coming to you as always from the intellectual dungeon on the outskirts of war torn st louis missouri we are glad you are with us wherever you may be joining us around the world or across this the greatest nation to ever exist on planet earth the united states of america good tuesday afternoon to you all and i wanted to uh kick off this week's festivities with a couple of news stories. Uh, you may have heard of these stories. Then again, you may not have. Uh, they have been reported in various places, but they have not been emphasized. So in case you have not heard these, I wanted to take a moment to bring you up to speed. If you're not aware of some of what's going on. The first story I want to highlight comes to us from foxnews.com, a story that came out on, I believe, June the 19th, written by Robert Gerty. And your headline, Illegal Immigrant Charged with Killing Two Miami Women Dumping Bodies on Street. Here is your story. An illegal immigrant has been charged with killing two Miami prostitutes and dumping their bodies on the street, according to reports. Juan Carlos Hernandez Cesarez, a 37-year-old roofer, was arrested Saturday for the murders months apart of Anne Ferrin, 41, and Needy Roche, 39, the Miami Herald reported. He is being held without bail. The 39-year-old is also being held on an immigration detainer. Their bodies were found where they had been dumped by a man in a car, according to the paper and WTVJ. A surveillance camera captured each dumping, the two news outlets reported. Cops found Farron's body on June the 13th. The arrest report released by police says Hernandez Cesares admitted punching Farron in the throat and neck when they got into an argument in his car during sex. Regardless of the lifestyle she chose, she didn't deserve that, and we hope she is, we hope he is put away so he cannot harm anyone else, a statement from Farron's family read in part, the Herald reported. Roach's body was found March the 2nd. She had been choked to death, WTVJ reported. An Immigrations and Customs Enforcement spokesman told the Herald that Hernandez Cesares was an, quote, illegally present Honduran international, end quote. Another story that I wanted to bring to you, this comes from uh, Katie Pavlich, one of her columns on townhall.com. This one posted June the 22nd. Your headline, slew of MS-13 members from El Salvador charged with murder of teenagers in Virginia. The Department of Justice announced murder and kidnapping charges for 11 MS-13 gang members in Alexandria, Virginia, Friday morning. All of them are from El Salvador, range in age from 20 to 27 years old, and are being prosecuted for the killing of teenagers Ed Edvin Escobar-Mendez and Sergio Arita Trimenillo. 
One of the defendants is not in custody and suspected of being out of the country. The other 10 are being held in federal detention. Whether the members are in the U.S. illegally is unclear. Let me interject here. There's 11 people involved. If all 11 of them were legal American citizens, I will eat my hat. You'd have a better chance of picking the trifecta in the Kentucky Derby than you would of all 11 of those uh, miscreants being legal citizens. We move on in the story here. While we note in the press release that all of the defendants are from El Salvador, we did not include include any information as to their immigration status. U.S. Attorney's Office Director of Communications for the Eastern District of Virginia, Joshua Stuve, tells Town Hall. From the Department of Justice, according to the allegations in the indictment in August 2016, Elmer Zelaya Martinez, Eric Palacios Ruiz, Ronald Herrera Contreras, and Jose... How do you pronounce that name? J-O-S-U-E. Is that Jose? Jose? It's not even Jose. There's a U in there. Jose? Vigil Mejia conspired together and with others to lure a 17-year-old male, Mendez, who they suspected was a member of a rival gang to a park in Fairfax County, Virginia, in order to attack and kill him. After killing him and to conceal evidence linking them to the juvenile's disappearance and murder, These four defendants and their co-conspirators buried the juvenile's remains. The indictment further alleges that in September 2016, Elmer Zelaya Martinez, Eric Palacios Ruiz, Ronald Herrera Contreras, Henry Zelaya Martinez, Oscar Contreras Aguiar, Jonathan Melgar Martinez, Pablo Miguel Barrera Velasco, Anderson Villatoro, Francisco Avila Avalos, and Freddy's Barris Abarca conspired together and with others to lure a 14-year-old male, Tremenio, to the same park in Fairfax County where he was attacked and killed because he was thought to be cooperating with law enforcement. The juvenile's remains were also buried. Each of the following members face life in prison if convicted, and they have a table there with all of the uh, uh, suspects' names and so forth. The charges are part of the Justice Department's ongoing crackdown on the violent transnational gang. Prosecutors are seeking DOJ approval to charge death-eligible offenses. So that story from Town Hall. Now, why did I take time at the start of our program to highlight those two stories to you? Why did I start off the show... Instead of just easing into this with a nice little introduction and that sort of thing, why why did I start this program with two stories of violence, murder, crime, and death, one of which we know was at the hands of an illegal alien, the other of which involved 11 people that I would be shocked if at least some of them weren't illegal aliens. Why? Why did I start the show on such a downer, for lack of a better term? I started the program with those stories because for the last two weeks, every time you have turned on a television, every time you have logged onto the internet, every time that you have heard a Democratic politician, or even some Republican politicians open their mouth. Every time you've heard a pontificator or a member of the chattering class or uh, a, a talking head, if you will, open their mouth. Every time you've heard a celebrity speak, you have heard nothing but a particular narrative and a particular characterization of illegal aliens. A false characterization of illegal aliens, I would, I would maintain. But you and I, whenever we have turned on the television, the computer, the radio, whatever, open a newspaper, Watch the evening news. 
We have had shoved down our throats for the last two weeks, give or take. A characterization, a false characterization, of illegal aliens being nothing more than erstwhile, hard-working people who are simply trying to find a better life for their families and nothing more. It has all been accompanied by the close-up camera shots of the most precocious and doe-eyed little kids at the border they can find. And if they're crying, all the better. And breathless concerns from commentator and journalist alike that what kind of nation can we be? What kind of country can we be? If we're separating these kids from their parents at the border. But then when the president takes executive action to try and prevent that from happening, trying to keep them together while still going through the process of dealing with the scourge of illegal immigrants, then then that's not good enough for them. Then suddenly, why are we keeping people incarcerated or locked up at all? There has been, and there is no doubt... There has been a clear and deliberate attempt to soften the image of illegal immigrants over the last couple of weeks. To guilt us into accepting a portrayal of them that quite frankly is not true Given the two stories that I mentioned at the top of the program and many more many more stories you can find on your own through the search engine of your choosing. We have consistently been told for the last two weeks how unfair we are being towards illegal aliens, how hateful we are being towards illegal aliens. How even racist and xenophobic and whatever else we're being. But none of it takes away from one very simple fact. None of it takes away from the one very simple fact that at the end of the day, the most important responsibility that I have And the most important responsibility that you have is the protection of our families and ourselves. To look out for them, their well-being, physically, economically, whatever the case might be. That under no circumstances do we owe the quote-unquote rest of society Under no circumstances do we owe foreigners who are trying to come into our country, under no circumstance do we owe them more of an opportunity, more safety, more of a a chance to come in here and potentially be harmful to us. We don't owe them that more than we owe our own children. You and I know that. And deep down, the media, the journalists, the politicians, they know that we know that, and that's why they're trying to guilt us into getting weak and changing our stance on this. The coverage of this over the last week has been nothing short of the old Sally Struthers commercials we used to see in the 1990s. You remember those. You would come home late from a night at the bar, you'd flip on the TV, and there was Sally Struthers in some godforsaken third world crap hole. Or maybe it was a lot in Hollywood, I don't know. With some little kid playing in a mud hole. And what did they do? They would always they would always have the camera shot real tight on the kid's face. And he'd look right into the camera with the big doe eyes. And Sally Struthers would tell you about how poor little Haji hadn't eaten today. Meanwhile, when the camera would go back to Sally Struthers, you'd notice that she hadn't missed too many meals. But I suppose that was beside the point. 
And they would then try to guilt you into sending a certain amount of money every month so that Haji could get an education and Haji could get warm meals and Haji could have a future. And meanwhile, you're sitting there thinking, wait, wait, wait. I've got my own loved ones I have to take care of. What do I owe Haji anyway? Well, that's what they're trying to do today with all this illegal immigrant stuff, trying to guilt us into keeping these families together. And oh, by the way, just letting them letting them stay over here without coming to justice and run roughshod over us and all the rest. There is no doubt that America's approach to immigration has to change. And probably change rather drastically. And God bless our president for, for trying to do what he can to get that going the right way, and others in his administration for doing so as well. And they are they are enduring some horrific behavior from leftists and left-leaning American citizens. We might talk about that a little bit later in the program. But the bottom line is they're at least getting the process started on that, and that's making people on the left flip out. Now, I know that there are different types of approaches being discussed on Capitol Hill right now. There's bills that are being presented. There's bills that are failing. There's debate over everything. But I wanted to do something a little bit different today. Instead of simply being reflexive on this program and analyzing the bills that are out there and the bills that have failed and the bills that might pass and so forth, instead of getting caught up in all the political back and forth over this, I wanted to take a different approach. Because this problem is so pervasive, this problem is so large, this problem is so important, that I think the best thing we can do is start with a blank slate. And instead of analyzing things based on the prospect of how we've done them before, or how some others would like to do them now, let's start from the ground up. In other words, if we were to build an immigration bill on this radio program, and we could make it anything we want, what would it be? What would it be? That's the exercise I wanted to engage you in this afternoon. And the reason I want to do that is because when you get into all of this negotiating and back and forth and debate between things that already exist, you, you, you often cut yourself off from doing things that could be very positive. And, and it's like any other negotiation. You never go into no, to a negotiation with your first offer being the, the minimum that you will accept. No, you go in there shooting for the moon. And the chances are you'll end up with something a little bit better than you would otherwise. So that's why I want to start the prospect of shooting for the moon here. If we were to create an immigration bill, what would it be? Well, the starting point would be that I think any immigration bill that we come up with in America has to be focused on one thing, and that is protecting the safety, security, and economic well-being of American citizens. Many people are looking at the immigration debate as some sort of a balance between the needs of American citizens versus the needs of illegal aliens. That is completely and abjectly wrong. As we approach this daunting issue, the needs and the wants of illegal immigrants must not factor into the equation whatsoever. The reason we have a government, any government at all, is to protect the American citizens from our enemies. So in that perspective, when we discuss a bill or discuss how we're going to deal with invaders coming over here, the last thing we should do is be worrying about what they think about it. This one's for us. This is about us. What do we want to do about immigration? Well, I have come up with a five-point plan, and you can tell me what you think of it online at Real Travis Cook on Twitter. 
But here's my five-point plan. Number one, build the wall. Okay, I know you've heard build the wall until you're blue in the face. But it is a key component. If you have a plumbing problem in your home, you're not going to start making the repairs until you've shut off the water, right? Because if water keeps coming into the room, if you make repairs while the water's still coming in, the repairs are just going to get torn up. It's not going to work. You have to stop the flow of water. Any plumber will tell you that. If you have a problem with your toilet, your problem in your basement, you got to stop the flow of sewage, right? Well, if we're going to correct this immigration problem, the first thing we have to do is stop the flow of human sewage coming up from the southern part of this continent. So first things first, build the wall. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that building the wall in and of itself will solve everything. It will not, but it's a key first step. It's at least an impediment to people coming over here. Will that completely stop people? No. Some people will try to find some way around that. We get that. We'll deal with that later. But at least build the wall and curtail it. And not only do you build the wall, but you back that up with a military presence. You put tanks on the border. You put guns on the border. You put infantry on the border. So if someone does get past that wall, they don't get much further past it. Now, I know that sounds a little, like a little bit much to some people, but you've got to understand, we in the United States have been very fortunate. We have been one of the few nations over the years that has not had to, to worry about border security the way other, a lot of other nations have. Most nations have something on their border. It might be a wall. It might be a fence. It's probably a checkpoint, probably military in some way in order to enforce their borders. Because we've been largely surrounded by oceans, we haven't had to do that much but we're now at a point that we have to. While we may not be used to the idea of having a, a wall and a military in the border, it's really not that much different than what a lot of the rest of the world has to do. So that's the first point. Build the wall and back it up with the military. Number two, make it a felony for anybody on this side of the border not supposed to be here. In other words, right now, if you cross the border illegally and it's your first time, it's a misdemeanor. In that, automatic felony, first time out. Whether you come across the border or whether you're already here illegally. Felony. Point number three, that felony will be enforced with punishment up to and including the death penalty. Now I know this sounds a little bit harsh to some of you, but remember, this is not only for our self-protection, but it's, it's also an attempt to make crossing the border and make being an illegal alien such a such a task that has such a low return on investment if you will a low likelihood of actually working for you that you don't even bother coming over in the first place and that maybe some people self-deport that's what we want the point is to cut off the flow so if you, if you make it almost certain punishment and death if they come over here, that's the best way to do it. Number four, a lot of people have been uh, trying to use the asylum loophole, even though if you truly wanted asylum in America, there are, I believe, uh, isn't it nine embassies and one consulate in, in, in Mexico where you could do that? You don't have to come to the border for it. But anyway, the loophole that liberals are always using is, well, they're seeking asylum. You can't cut them off. How about this? America adopts a no asylum policy for at least a few years. I mean, we've been very generous over 200 plus years taking in a lot of people that want to come over here. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to cut off good people who, who, who don't have anything else, but they don't have any other way of, of, of living life. But by the same token, we've got to take care of ourselves first, folks. So a no asylum policy for the next few years may help us kind of right the ship and, and, and hit the reset button on where we are. And number five, and this one might be a little less critical, but and, and not something you do right out of the gate, but it might have to come up a little bit later on. One of the criticisms you always get from leftists who are into this open border crap is, well, if you don't have those illegal aliens here, who's going to do those jobs? Who's going to pick the lettuce? Who's going to 
pick the tomatoes. Bim, 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 bim. And on the surface, they make a point because, you know, it's hard to get Americans to do those jobs these days. But it can be done. End the minimum wage and drastically reduce the welfare system in America. Now, what will that do? Well, right now, you don't see Americans taking those jobs because they'd have to be paid a minimum wage, and that just doesn't make it financially feasible to produce lettuce or crops or whatever, so those jobs go to illegal aliens. Plus, the folks we've got on welfare right now wouldn't take those jobs even if they could be offered them because, hey, they're on welfare and they don't have to work for that. Why not take away the welfare and end the minimum wage? Then they would have to go back to that. We could have Americans doing those jobs instead of Mexicans. And before you, you guffaw at that, think of the Dust Bowl. When those desperate families had to have work and they went to, to California to work in the fields and work on the farms, they did the jobs that illegal aliens are doing today. And they did them for probably a similar wage. And it was a lifesaver for them. But we can't do that for poor Americans now. We could do it if we end the minimum wage and drastically reduce welfare. That's the, that's the uh, immigration program I've come up with. And we'll talk about it more right after the break here on CFR Live. 